Right, so for this, I wanted to make a quick video on addressing some of the questions I've been seeing come up on the little character switch video I made a long time ago that was like, oh, hit this button and you'll go from one character to the other. It has a transition camera that kind of flies back and forth between the two. Uh, this one's going to be very bare bones rundown of like what, how to get the character to at least be possessed by an AI controller after the player controller has left that pawn. Uh, so that way the character will actually continue doing whatever actions after it's done. Um, I'm not going to be going into any crazy like AI stuff or um, deep diving into some like other crazy mechanics. Uh, it's just very quick to address like how can you get the character to still keep doing an action after you've left or to be able to build, build beyond having the character be able to move after you've unpossessed that character. Um, so from here, uh, uh, this is just a basic third person template. Uh, one of the first things I'm going to do that uh, I want to make sure of is I'm going to have everything kind of be read as the character, as the player starts on the map instead of actually spawning in and using something that's already in the level. Uh, so I'm just going to go into the third person blueprint folder here, blueprints, and I'm going to drop in a player controller. Because the game mode for this map actually doesn't have anything in it. Uh, whenever you push play, you're automatically as this third person character. Uh, so what I want to do is create a game mode so I can actually make my own custom player controller to be able to flip back and forth between the uh, different characters inside the level. Because this is all using the default stuff that comes with the engine, uh, even though if it says none. So let's go to the third person blueprint folder. I'm going to do this one here. I'm going to name it uh, PC underscore for player controller, character switch. Okay. I'm going to open up that character switch. And let's go. Oh, excuse me. Uh, this is not a player controller. This is a game mode. My goodness. I don't know how I messed that up already, but off to a great start, let's just say. So GM underscore character switch. All right, open up the game mode and let's add in our own player controller because we don't have one. So let's go to third person blueprints, blueprints, and let's call this one our uh, my underscore player controller. Okay. And let's make sure that we don't have anything that we're currently possessing just right now. Uh, so it gives us a default pawn, so if I go into the map and I change the game mode to be what ours is, and it already took ours quickly because we added, it already took ours because we made one from there. Uh, if I hit play, I'm still playing as this third person character, which is not correct. What I'm supposed to be using is a default pawn, which is basically a spear that just flies around. It's just like a spectator, more or less. Uh, the problem is with that is that even though it says that our our default pawn is the default pawn. Um, this character in this map is actually, if you go to its details, go down to the bottom, you'll see that its pawn, its settings was manually set by someone to say player zero. So when they made this template, they put this to player zero. Uh, let's just disable that. Uh, to make sure that we don't, if we do add another one of these guys that it does keep disabled, I'm gonna hit control E on this third person character and I'm going to go to its properties and I'm going to make sure that it's auto possessed players disabled and it is. So now if I play, uh, it's going to try putting me close to zero, zero, zero in a way or close to the center, but I am actually flying around as the default pawn. Okay. So let's work between these two guys. So I'm going to take this first one here and flip them around. So what I'm possessing, I can kind of see back and forth between the two, like what's going on. All right. I'm going to jump back to my player controller. And I'm going to start adding in some logic to actually make a list of how many characters that I want to jump between inside this world is. Uh, because I'm being more specific on this I'm real, and I'm wanting to only use those third person characters in that level. Um, this, is, this is fine to use a node called the get all actors of class. This node is not really useful when you're trying to do like a search for hundreds and hundreds of objects inside of a level. So I'm going to do one second here. Phone kept going off. Okay, let's do a third person 
character. Let's do a search for those. I'm going to do a loop for each of them. Oh, excuse me. Actually, I'm going to promote this. Yes, each. And I'm going to do... I'm going to be taking this list of every character that's found in the level, and I'm going to make this... I'm going to make a variable inside of this player controller that actually has a list from that. So I'm going to put this as... I'm going to name this variable characters. And I'm going to change this from just a single reference to an array. So the array is going to act as a, a container for our list that we are going to create. So I'm going to do a git, hold that control and let go. I'm going to do an add. And for each one of these characters that it's found, add it to our character list. Uh, I'm going to pile this. And if I end up, if you accidentally add anything in here, um, it may have some trouble trying to find all the characters in the level. It's going to find them regardless, but it's going to act like there's five characters because I have three empty spots. So just kind of make sure this is empty. All right. So once our characters are done, I want to add a label to our guys inside the level because I don't know what these characters are. Like they don't have names or colors or any of that stuff. I don't want to go into two of the materials and change it right now because that's a little too overboard. So let's just add a quick text edit. So I'm going to hit control E on this guy to open him up for his blueprint. I'm going to add in a component. I'm going to call it text render. Text render always goes to zero. So I'm going to put that right above his head. And I'm going to make it a little bit bigger, so let's 26, so I'm going to go about like 32. And that's what I need, so I just need to make sure I get a reference to this. So back in our player controller, I'm going to, do a, I'm going to loop through each one of our characters that was added to this list. I'm going to do a reference, I'm going to need to get a component by class. And it's going to be a text component. And from that, I want to set the text of that component to be labeled the array index. So whatever the character is in this list, that label that we put above his head is going to either read 0 or 1 or however many characters are added to the level. So if I play, oh, that, there it is. All right, there's our player start. I'm gonna drag that over. I'm just going to rotate it and bring it up just a bit. There we go. So if I hit play, it's completely backwards. Strange. This is just so I uh, can have it facing the right way. Okay, there we go. So this guy is one and he is zero. So if I added, say, another one, there are two more guys, zero, one, two, three, four, and it'll continue on from there. So let's just start with these two, these two only. So now we have a label for those, and I need a way to control jumping between these characters. So I'm going to have my debug button be tab, and every time I hit tab, I want to get one of these characters. I'm going to get a copy of the array. I'm going to promote this index controller number to a variable. And I'm going to have a hard set this number in here right now. Um, usually not the best way to do this, but for now, this is fine. Because I'm just doing an example of addressing a problem. So I'm going to call this pawn ID. And whoops, I'm going to do an alt drag, copy this node. Right before that, I'm going to hit 0 and 1 because I only have two characters in the map. I'm going to call a flip flop. And every time I hit tab, I want it to jump between setting this pawn ID to 0 or 1. It's going to get either one of the characters that it found in there. And we're going to call inside this controller a possess. And I want to possess the pawn that it found here. And both of those will run into that. Cool. So that's basically our flip-flop to go between those two. So now if I tested this, 
See, I have zero and one. If I hit tab, I'm going to unpossess my current pawn, which was the default pawn, which is that sphere there. And now I'm running around as zero, and I'm running around as one. So the, the tutorial I made before, like it had a fancy little camera that kind of, you know, zoomed in between both of them. And transition, this one's just a quick flip back and forth. So if I went to this guy and I jumped in the air and I, and I possessed, now he's floating in the air and that presents a problem. The same is with if I'm running and I unpossess, now I have to repossess the other guy, but he continues to move. Uh, this is the issue that I'm going to address right now. How can we keep these characters from doing that after we've already unpossessed them? Well, the easy way to do it is to make sure that they have a controller that is controlling them after the player controller has left. There are two types of controllers you can use, a player controller and an AI controller. There's custom AI controllers that you can make, and there's also a default one that comes with the engine that usually is usually already assigned to this pawn. By if going down to the pawn area, where is it? There's input actor pawn, and you'll see auto possessed by player zero. We we'll turn that off in the map because before it was player zero, which is the first one entered, automatically possesses him. Auto possess an AI, which is placed in the world. I'm going to do it placed or spawn in case I add them dynamically. And our AI controller, which is basically this, oh, excuse me, this AI controller is, comes automatically with the engine. So you can make your own if you'd like, if you write your own AI logic. Uh, for this, I want to be able to make a reference to that. So let's first write some debug information for this. So on the event tick, I'm going to do a print string and I want to see from their names I'm going to grab a reference to the text render I'm going to get the text and I want to print that and if you are always like adjusting these things a little bit at a time you can always just select them and hit Q and that'll automatically straighten them out and I'm going to do an append so I'm going to add a uh, is controlled by dash space and I'm going to get the controller for this guy. Uh, I'm going to get the controller for this third person character blueprint and from that drag that into the pin below this and it'll get its name and add that to it. So when I hit play I'm going to see a bunch of information like overcrowding information of text. I'm just going to set this print string to zero for duration because it's on a tick, which is every frame, I don't need to have it like stay on the screen that long. So now I can have a little bit more legible. I'll make that red real quick. Full red. There we go. Now, if I hit play, a little bit more legible to read. And we'll see that 0 is controlled by AI controller 1, and 1 is controlled by AI controller. Cool. Uh, if I wanted to, I can make it a little bit more obvious by adding another text and all that stuff to see their above their heads, but seeing it on the screen should be fine for now. Uh, but for visual sake, let's just add that anyways. So let's add another text render. Okay, zero this out right below. I'm going to make this one a bit bigger. And I'm going to set this color to red. Cool. So let us go to text render. I'm going to set the text. Usually it's never optimal to do this every frame, but I can do this on begin play. So begin play. And print that or put that down. And I'm going to do the name of it, of the controller. There we go. So now this happens one time at the beginning. All right. Uh, so I may do as well because we're going to switch back and forth dynamically. After we've initially set the name, it's going to kind of do that afterwards. This would be more optimal, but this is just in a quick example. Let's add that string. Okay, so now as we're playing, we should see the names of AI controller one, and this is AI controller. Cool. 
So I'm going to get rid of that. Sorry, I added that a little bit of redundancy there. Now, let, let's do something of what happens when I switch characters. So if I switch into one of these characters, you'll see that our player controller now controls this guy. So what I want to do is assign an AI to this character after I've already left him. So on begin play, let's bring that node back again. Oops. I want to make a reference to our controller that's made in the beginning of this. So I'm going to get a reference to self. I want to get a reference to or get information on get the AI controller to this guy. And I want to promote that to a variable because I want to store this information so I can call it for later. And I'm going to call this one the AI controller underscore ref. And now we have a variable. So when this character is made, we are now going to see what this is saved out as. Uh, the reason for that is because I don't need to make a new controller every time I unpossess this character. Uh, spawning it is not the most optimal way. If we have it made once, why make it a bunch of times when we can just keep using it? So I'm going to grab a reference to that controller. And on the event of when we get unpossessed, uh, this gets fired along with possessed. Whoops. Event possessed, this will get fired every time this player controller does a possess event. Uh, you can also find these events listed here in this list of functions with the override dropdown. But we just need the uh, unpossessed for now. So every time we get unpossessed, I want to find out if the controller that is leaving this character behind was it player controlled. And if it was player controlled, then we need to do a possess from this one. We can't do possess call from here because only controllers can really do that. So let's do a possess event. And from what pawn they want, I want this AI controller to do, I want it to do self. So now, as we run around, you'll see when we go and possess one of these guys, hitting tab, I have a player controller on this guy here for zero. I run around and I go switch the other guy. Let me flip him around so I can see. You'll see the AI controller is taken back over zero again. So let's flip. So AI controller takes him. And if I jump in the air, you'll see that he continues to fall. If I go to run, I switch, he stopped. So that should solve the issue with all the uh, crazy little bugs of him falling uh, down in really weird spots. That's a strange collision of them continuing to do what they need to. You did notice that his momentum did not continue uh, when he was going through the air, because again, the AI is taking input automatically to him. So it's like, I'm not, it's like if I was jumping in the air and I just let go of my control, he should keep going. That's just some bug debugging you'll have to do later for your own custom stuff. So hopefully that addresses that weird little issue that's going on and hopefully you answer some questions. So thanks.